Lottie Bowser, I am delighted to have you on our Therapy Works podcast. And you've worked in TV and film, and now you're a yoga teacher, and you have your own podcast, Lemonade Podcast, Mm -hmm. and the author of a really wonderful, very moving book called Bittersweet, A Story of Love and Loss. Thank you so much for having me. That was a lovely introduction. It's a pleasure. And I've been thinking about you and how old you are and what you've been through. And I'd love to know what is the greatest challenge you have faced or are facing? Mm. Mm. The greatest challenge I have faced. So it would without doubt be the death of my partner, Ben, and learning to rebuild my life in the wake of his death from the ground up, a partner in it is inextricably woven into your moment to moment, day to day experience. And I was with him throughout the formative years of my twenties from 24 to 30 when he tragically died. He died of cancer and COVID complications. He? he died of cancer and COVID. That's right. He was at that point. 36. He was so young. 36, yeah. He was handed a terminal diagnosis just three months after receiving the all clear, actually, in in March 2020 at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we threw the kitchen sink at the disease. We tried every possible treatment pathway from chemotherapy to other alternative medicines and nothing worked. So brutal. Mm, So brutal. So brutal. And... He was actually receiving treatment at an alternative center in Tijuana in Mexico when he caught COVID. And sadly, although the treatment was working, we were seeing progress. He ended up on a ventilator and in the end passed away from complications arising from the virus, but also his cancer. You knew that he had a life-threatening illness. You were fighting with a lot of hope Mm. that he would beat it and using both chemo and alternative medicine. But then the side attack of COVID must have felt particularly cruel and particularly difficult to manage. You know, when you are facing a terminal diagnosis head on, even though COVID was very much alive and wreaking havoc globally, We'd taken all the necessary precautions. We'd spent eight months in isolation, just the two of us, barely stepping beyond the threshold of our front door. So in the bubble and the safety of the cancer center, it was really the last thing on our mind. And the uh, diagnosis, the virus just came out of nowhere. And it was only after he was put on life support that he was tested for COVID. And his family and I realized that was what led to the unraveling. Because his immune was compromised already, I guess. Exactly. And his particular cancer, it had metastasized to his lungs and respiratory tract. So he was considered extremely vulnerable. To COVID. Yeah. Yeah. I can see it in your body now, like going back four years. Often there's a a narrative around death and dying is that you get over it Mm. and move on. And I can see in you that you do learn to find joy and you do learn to live, Mm -hmm. but you don't get over those experiences. I can see it embedded in your chest as you're speaking, that time in Tijuana, Mm. it's like in your head. Wow, that's incredibly observant. I'm amazed you're able to witness that. Yeah, I can feel it. Absolutely. It's a pressure cooker, a a bubbling beneath the surface. Exactly. My nervous system is it's definitely nowhere near as as bad as it was at the time or even in the weeks, months, year, two years out from his death. But yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure you're ever able to shake yourself free from an experience like that mentally and emotionally. And that's so important for our listeners to change this narrative, isn't mm. it? The intensity of the pain changes. Mm. Like if you'd felt that three months afterwards, you probably would have cried a lot. You probably couldn't have found words. You may have had a big and physical kind of response. Mm. Now you can step back enough to be able to talk about what happened, 
but the bubbling and the sensation is embodied. It's sort of in your being. And I'm not even sure, you tell me, would you want to not have that response? Would you want to forget? Mm, it's so interesting you ask that question because people often say that grief is the price we pay for love. And I think for me, it's the other side of the coin of love. So absolutely. Because price sounds like a bad thing. It does. Yeah. And to live is to lose. To love is to lose one day. It's an inevitability that we all face. There's obviously many ways I stay connected to my late partner. And it's not just through my grief, but it is the thread, one of the threads that connects us. And I wouldn't want to not feel it because it reminds me that he mattered and he matters still. And the love between yeah. us is still present. So, mm. And that never dies. It doesn't. And I know you love dancing and moving and mm. obviously yoga. <laughs> and I was thinking it's a delicate dance, isn't it, between staying attached to the connection and love for him and the pain that inevitably brings but not falling victim to it, mm -hmm. of not letting it become all of you and choosing to live and love again. And mm. you said former partner mm. because you've chosen, and I guess it was a big task mm. in letting yourself love again. The task is too robotic, a big challenge. Mm. Huge, enormous. But the thing about death is that it's a forced separation. It's, it's involuntary, isn't it? So it's not the same as a breakup, even though one party might not have wanted it. I call that a living loss. Mm. It has its own complexities, Absolutely. but it's very different. Incredibly yeah. painful, mm. but not the same. And so it's been so challenging to assimilate both versions of myself and to reconcile with letting go of what was, and I don't mean Ben, I carry Ben with me every day, but letting go of that life and stepping fully into my, my new life, the version of me that is sort of still becoming. Has a beating heart, is alive. Exactly. So is it letting go of the life you expected? Is that been the work? Yeah. And letting yourself be in and embrace and love the life that you have mm. whilst you hold mm -hmm. Ben within you. So much of my life looks radically different to what it looked like when I was with Ben. I actually stopped teaching yoga because I don't quite know. I think it was the career that I built and developed and maintained throughout the six, seven year course of our relationship. And when he died, so much no longer resonated. You know, I wasn't that person mm. anymore. I had to kind of rediscover who I was in his absence. So I left that behind. I actually left London. I moved abroad. I needed to reimagine my life again on a blank canvas. I needed to not be around the continual triggers and reminders. And I recognized that I was in an incredibly fortunate position to even have the choice to do that. Choice. Psychologically, there's this idea of doing a geographical, but you go to a new place because you want to be a different you and you want to have a different life. But actually, often you carry your suitcase of burdens with you. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> but I think both is true. Mm. I think it can really help going to a new place mm. and seeing new people and ha giving yourself a vision of a different future. Mm. I think life had felt as well so small and so insufferable for so long that I craved novelty. I wanted to just reach for the things that felt light and joyful and fun again. And new. And new, exactly. And while I knew that my grief would follow me wherever I went, as you said, it's not something that is restricted to a postcode or a country. <laughs> I, I just to be in our flat and to be in the same routine with the same familiar faces and different corners of London that reminded me of different points of our relationship. I was sort of trapped. I was reliving it constantly. So 
I needed to just to escape, frankly. And it was one of the best decisions I could have made for myself. But I'm very aware of my privilege there. It's not something that everybody has the means to do. Tell me about the escape, how that worked for you, being somewhere new, mm. stepping away from all the kind of, I hate this word now because it's overused, triggers of Ben and your life here. How did it, what happened? I think it enabled me to get a little bit of distance, as I said, from the environment in which Ben's diagnosis and illness and death unfolded. I was distracted a lot of the time. But again, coming back to what I touched on earlier, it was really challenging to assimilate what was and what was becoming. And that's such a good point. And so while I had anonymity here, it also meant that I was far removed from my support system and and my mum, my stepdad, and the people around me that really understood. So each new interaction, each new connection that I was forging, none of these people knew what I had been through. And at that point, I felt like I wanted to brand it on my head. I am grieving. I am essentially an unofficial widow. Widow. Exactly. And that became all the more difficult when I met my new partner, Manu, and I was introduced to his community as this new love interest of his and eventually his new partner. But all the while I had this life that I was still grieving that they were completely unaware of. And so it was really difficult trying to step into these new roles whilst coming to terms with what no longer was this version of myself that died with Ben. The the word that helps me with that is this one word, it's multitudes, Mm. that we are multitudes. Mm. and that we have so many different versions of ourselves Mm. that are alive and up and active. Mm. And we may show one version in one place with some people and another version in another place with others, or that there are some that we just keep for ourselves. Mm. And in some ways, I've just been on a, a trauma conference and there's this theory called internal family systems developed by Dick Schwartz. And he talks about we have parts, we have many different parts. Mm. And I think if you can give yourself the umbrella of you're allowed to be multitudes, Mm. they don't fight each other in the same way. It's Mm. not like I have to show them all of me. Mm. I think it's more letting yourself have all of them and then choosing to share parts of yourself that feel right for then or something like that. God, that's so, (laughs) I'm I'm grinning because that's so beautiful. What a lovely perspective. I hadn't even considered that. Yeah, there's been a a sense of, and perhaps this is me internalizing a lot of the misconceptions around grief and more specifically partner loss. But I think I felt a pressure to let go of those parts of myself that were alive with Ben. But actually, I don't need to, do I? They can all coexist. (laughs) I think, I really think they can. I think sometimes people's pressure on you to get over, get better, get on, which always feels like you're leaving somebody behind. And I think Mm. you talk about moving forward, but you move forward with them, Mm. which I think is much more realistic. There can be an intensity of it that you just want to punch their face, don't Mm. you really? Mm. (laughs) <laughs> oh, Julia, <laughs> yes. I'm not a violent person and I don't uh, condone Punch. violence. No, but absolutely. Yeah, there's been many a smile through gritted teeth. Tell me the top four things that have annoyed you most that you'd like other people to know and not do to somebody else. Oh. First of all, legitimize that you're a widow even if you weren't married. I think that's important. Mm, I really appreciate that. Yes, I, I think that... <sighs> There isn't an official word assigned to those of us who are left behind having not crossed that threshold and got that piece of paper. And it was absolutely the intention to do so. We were engaged. We were planning our wedding, but, you know, terminal diagnosis tends to get in the way of your Did plans. <laughs> yeah, precisely. And I remember his oncologist... It's like being ghosted, isn't it? Mm. By society. It It does feel like that, exactly. It felt as though... 
the weight of Ben's death and the fallout of it, what it meant for me was undermined. It was diminished. It was not that bad, basically. That was the assumption, I think. At least you weren't married. At least you didn't have children. You're so oh, young. Oh, God. You're oh, so my- God, yeah, all the at least lots of at least, and I just at think, least. yeah, when you're confronted by somebody in pain, no matter what follows, at least it's it just no, it's just not appropriate. <laughs> don't st- don't yeah. start the sentence with at least exactly because actually it takes a lot to even open up about this kind of thing to speak to these experiences out loud, so. We have to be very delicate, I think, hold the pain very delicately. Gosh, all manner of things. I'm just trying to think now, at least. Stay strong as well. People were quick to to that platitude. Uh, very, I think that was actually in some of the texts I received right after Ben died, acknowledging my loss. And at that point, I didn't know which way was up or down. My life had been obliterated to smithereens. How how could I possibly have felt strong strong. in that moment? And it just implies, I think, a lack of understanding. I don't think we're particularly good in the face of difficult experiences, emotions, whether it's the experience of grief or otherwise. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sort of trying to do my bit to help us get better yes exactly and advocate for people in similar positions but yeah all manner of things Mm. he's in a better place did you get that one he's in a better place time heals all wounds it's just these sort of cliche sound bites sorry that we tend to reach for i think probably when we're feeling a bit uncomfortable and when we don't know what to say i think that's exactly that. And I think for people listening who've said it, and I've said it, we've all said things that, definitely, you know, on reflection could have been more sensitive. But I think if you don't know what to say, just stay with and say, I'm so sorry this happened to you. Acknowledgement. That covers a, acknowledgement. That covers a lot of bases. I agree. And then the person will open up or they'll change the subject or they'll do whatever they do. But the, It's not hard to say, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. And to say, I just don't know what to say. No words could ever offer any sort of consolation right now. I hear you. I see you. This is awful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Some people actually find, I don't know what to say, really annoying as well. Mm, Okay. (laughs) Perhaps don't add that one in. I don't know, maybe, Mm. but because for some people it would be good. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. There's also the subjective. There are things that push our buttons. Mm -hmm. You moved country. You moved life. I did. You dared to love again. Mm -hmm. You dared to risk again. Yes. You dared people's judgments Mm -hmm. or, I don't know, Ben's parents or Mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. And so now you've let yourself love again. Mm -hmm. And then what was the next step that you took? Oh, goodness. Yeah, this, I must caveat this. It's been incredibly challenging. And people do tend to have a lot of opinions, I think, when it comes to dating again after the death of a partner. I recently saw somebody comment on my book, actually. She felt that I'd moved on too quickly. And I decided to dip my toe into the water again, eight months after Ben died. But Prior to that, there were aspects of mine and Ben's relationship that had already died. So, For instance, yes. no, sex. Physi- no sex, no physical intimacy. So it had been about a year, which for a 30-year-old woman, anyone, it's a long, a time, long time to go without en- so much of a whisper of attention or mm. connection. Well, touch hungry. Mm, absolutely. Connection hungry, intimacy hungry, and sex hungry. Yeah, absolutely. All the normal things that yeah. really all- shouldn't be shrouded in stigma or shame but I I needed it when I knew very early on I'd actually gone to have some fertility tests because I was fortunate enough to have access to Ben's sperm we retrieved his sperm prior to chemotherapy as it can often impact patients fertility 
So IVF was an option for me. And I remember exploring that route a little bit before realizing, actually, hang on, I don't want to do this alone. Hats off to anybody who decides to go down that route. It's incredible, very commendable. But for me, what was most important was to find love again, to find somebody Mm. to share my life with. And then if the opportunity to have children arose in the future, then amazing. So I knew that I I wanted that. And so I sought it out. I, I had no expectation that it would happen as quickly as it did. I simply downloaded a dating app when I was doing a recce in Lisbon, actually, the summer after Ben died. And I met my now partner, Manu, online. And it's been a very difficult road, lots mm. of bumps and U-turns, a breakup in between because of my grief and because of my love for Ben. So hard for him. Incredibly hard for him. He's been amazing. It's just been unprecedented. Because Ben, I guess, not really in you, but maybe in you, gets idealised, certainly in him, so he could never be Ben. Mm -hmm. And so he's always failing. That Mm. must be the thing that causes the tension. I think that was the biggest challenge in in the early days of our relationship, feeling as though he was often competing with somebody that was no longer here and who is perfect in death mm -hmm, absolutely yeah and so that's been really tough to navigate but the love has fortunately overridden all of the difficult stuff and now we're in a great place but yeah it's been really hard yeah so for all of the judgment and the assumptions it's difficult enough. We actually judge ourselves enough as well the without toughest. without having to deal with other people's expectations and judgment. So given you've had this really tough four years, mm. what are the things that have helped you? What has supported you? I think the thing that has helped most has been seeking out connections with other people that have gone through similar things. So right after Ben died, I remember feeling like an alien amongst my peers. Nobody had experienced anything like this. And it felt as though I was the only person in the world to have gone through something like this and to feel the weight of partner loss. And I would spend my sleepless nights in those weeks and months right after he died scrolling through Instagram, going down rabbit holes of various hashtags and pages and reaching out to people that I found in the comments who were sharing their stories of losing their partners. And those late night conversations soon flourished into friendships. I'm still friends with these people today and they've offered a sense of kinship, I guess, allyship, solidarity that others haven't been able to offer me. So that's been... That is the biggest thing, Mm. isn't it? That when your love for somebody dies, it is the love of others that helps you. And I think what you're talking about is being understood as you are, where you don't have to explain. Mm. You may have very different stories to these people, Mm. and you may have very different beliefs and But there's something about we've been in this Mm -hmm. together that you find your allyship, Mm -hmm. you find your kinship, which is such a relief. Mm. Such a relief, such a relief. And there's such strength as well to be found in numbers. I think isolation and loneliness is one of the biggest things that people suffering bereavement are struggling with. So finding others who understand even a fraction of what you're going through and and realizing actually that you're not alone, I found to be really helpful. And then leaning on the resources that are out there, your fantastic books were such, such a huge support and also therapy. My coach, she's a grief coach. She had lived experience of loss as well. So there was that level of relatability. She'd worked with many people who'd gone through loss and grief. So I found that to be really helpful too. What you're also not actually saying is that you want to engage in life. So you're going to look 
for help. You're going to look for your community. You're going to get therapy. You're mm. going to have a grief coach. You're going to choose life. And I think there's often the blocker for people who get, say, complex grief is that they can't mm. turn to themselves with that permission. And in some ways, I think you talk about this too, that kind of radical compassion. Mm. I am allowed to be this kind to myself mm. because grief has this terrible capacity to turn against us mm. and attack us and have what I call the shitty committee where you beat yourself up for not suffering mm. enough or suffering too much or not doing it right. And it feels like there was something in you mm. that thank thankfully gave yourself permission to see. Absolutely. I think the thing about death is that there's nothing that can be done to make it right. You okay? can't bloody fix it. You cannot fix it. You, As much as we wish, we could wave a magic wand and undo what happened, bring them back. We can't. So the only option then is to find a way to live with it, to carry the pain. And I realized that quite early on. And I also realized, Julia, I think perhaps grieving for those first few months in lockdown really brought this to my attention, but nobody was coming to save me, right? I actually had to sort of save myself, pull myself up out of that dark hole that I'd found myself in. So there was actually something quite empowering about that, you know, that whilst I cannot control what has happened, I actually do get to decide what the rest of my life looks like moving yeah. forwards, or at least as as much as what's within my capacity. So I found empowerment in that. And I knew as well that having gone through these immense waves of grief and then finding myself feeling numb or perhaps laughing at a joke that my stepdad made in the kitchen a moment later, that I was capable of experiencing many different things at once. I could hold both my grief and my joy simultaneously, and one didn't cancel out the other. And actually, yeah. as much as it probably sounds cliche to say this, Ben would have wanted me to yeah. reach for joy and levity. That's what he loved about you, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think coming back to that point you made earlier about granting ourselves radical compassion, it's okay to reach for the things that distract us a little bit, that comfort us, that make us feel relief, joy, even if it's just a, a tiny little My. glimmer. Exactly. And that takes me to sex again, because I think there really is, there's a taboo about death and dying, mm. but there's also a taboo about sex and grief. Mm. If you look at Freud, Eros and Thanatos, sex and death are completely interconnected. Mm -hmm. And sex is a life force. Sex is an energy mm. for living, procreating, being alive, being in your body. Mm. Whereas the death force can feel like the cells in your body are disintegrating mm. within you. And whilst I recognize that some people may not reach for sex or have wished that energy. I think for many of my clients, even when they've had a child die, mm. they find themselves pregnant three months later, mm. surprisingly. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a natural, like you need the body of somebody else when you're disembodied to help you feel alive. And I would really advocate not sex that does you harm or, mm. but as a, as a way of, being in yourself and allowing yourself mm. to live fully. Mm. And I think there's something to be said as well for just touching on what you've just expressed. Returning to your bodily sensations again. Yes, dancing, yoga, absolutely. swimming, but, movement. Mm, I think for me, I was very much in survival mode throughout those last eight months of Ben's life when we were sort of desperately trying to save him, that I was so disconnected from my body. I was in a state of trauma, actually. Yeah. I felt this constant sort of bubbling, this Heightened. stress. Heightened. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Terrified. Exactly. So sex was a way to just, you know, get out of my head and sort of dampen those 
I guess, trauma responses in favor of something more pleasurable and, yeah. Yeah. Enjoyable. Pleasure. And that takes, you know, in the polyvagal system where you have sympathetic when you're in the heightened sense, what you're describing is getting back into yeah. dorsal ventral, where your ventral vagal rather, where you're, you have all available to you. Mm. You have much more wise mind, more compassion, more mm -hmm. capacity to connect to others, social engagement. Mm. When you're in a very heightened state, you're brushed on and it's hard to take in love. It's hard to feel love and connection, mm. whereas ventral vagal is for social engagement and connection. Mm. And I think so long as it's not doing you harm, and I think we have to trust ourselves to be able to navigate these things and discern what feels good and what doesn't in the moment, it's okay to reach for those things, I think. I think it's more than okay. It's more I than it's okay. <laughs> it's a good thing. As I mentioned earlier, whatever brings a moment of relief, joy. Yeah. What reminds you of what it means to to be alive, to exist in the world as a normal human, because grief obviously just destroys your sense of normality, then go for it. Yeah. There shouldn't be any shame. Uh, no, and shame really toxifies all mm. suffering that's already there in grief. And there's a lot of shame, I think. It can be shame and grief. Mm. So your next step, if I'm right, was finding your narrative, finding your story and writing Bittersweet, the mm. story of love and loss. Mm. Was that therapeutic? Because people make assumptions about writing being therapeutic and it's cathartic. And I must say, for me, it was. And actually, oh, good. Mm, very soon after Ben died, I actually found myself wanting to write Naturally, just instinctively. Just instinctively. It was one of the other things, actually. You asked me earlier what I found helpful. Writing, journaling, just getting... Words on the page, getting it out. Absolutely. Stream of consciousness just out of my mind onto a page. And in some way, it enabled the pain to shift and change shape slightly. And I really found that to be true when writing the book, as much as it was difficult to unearth all of these memories that I'd buried. I found that it didn't hurt so much. I was looking at the experiences from a different vantage point because I'd unearthed them with the intention of telling the story. So it was in incredibly therapeutic and cathartic. And reaching the end of that process it felt like some sort of resolution had taken place, that I was ready to quite literally sort of close the book, close the chapter, close the chapter and move forwards. And that's, again, it's not in direct relation to Ben. I love him. I grieve for him every day. I carry him with me. I wrote this in the book. It doesn't press against the seams of my skin like it used to. It's a powerful image. Mm. Yeah. Are we all going to have pain but the suffering is when we turn into it and I think what you're talking about is expressing it mm. and finding ways of expressing it mm. and for you writing and I think for a lot of people and people listening you don't have to write a book you don't have to no. be published but I do think putting what is ephemeral and incohate in your body and seeing it written on the page mm. even if it isn't a full sentence but words feelings I think that is such a powerful way of expressing ourselves and it's been proven to be. Mm. There's good research on journaling. Yeah. And, and it's free. You don't have to have a therapist. You don't book an appointment. You can do it in your own time. Mm. And I think grief is such a physical experience, isn't it? It doesn't just live in our minds. It's very much in our bodies as well. And that energy has to go somewhere. So whether it is picking up a pen pouring it onto the pages or moving your body, shaking as well, Shaking's jumping, mm. walking, running, punching. I punched a lot of pillows in those early yeah, days. Yeah. And dancing, screaming. screaming. Scream? Oh, I screamed. Good Lord. Good. I screamed. It's a good job. My mum's house was detached. The house that we were living in at the time. Like I <laughs> call the police. Yeah, really. I would wait for her and my stepdad to step out the house. I just unleash, you know, it's, it's got to go somewhere.
I think yeah. if it stays in, and you'll know much more about this than me, but I'm sure it can then manifest in more pervasive ways down the line. It does. Um, I think it does. Mm. It really does. It goes into the cells of your being somehow. And exactly. Blocks your capacity to live and be. Mm. I think part of your mission, as I understand you, is to update people's database about <laughs> grief so that they don't do to you what happened to you. Mm. I find the fact that this is this universal experience that we all go through in life uh, sooner or later. Every single one of us. Nobody is exempt from loss no. and grief. And yet, and this is not really of any fault of our own, but we're completely and utterly inept at holding space for it, honoring it, nurturing it, bearing witness to it. And so... And can I pause you? Because each of those words is like a thesis, isn't it? Mm. Holding it, mm -hmm. honoring it, mm. bearing witness to it. Mm. Each of those is a very important aspect mm -hmm. that I think in our kind of rush to fix and get on mm. gets denied. Yeah. And I just find that wild. And to have felt so unbelievably isolated and lonely in my experience, which compounded Ben's death and his absence. I want to do my bit to alleviate that for others and mm. make them feel less alone, make them feel seen and heard and understood. And whether you've experienced the loss of a loved one or not, I hope that in talking about my own personal challenges, other people can see elements of themselves and their experiences in mine. There's yeah. such strength, I mentioned this earlier, but strength to be taken in storytelling, I think, in sharing really our stories hmm. and connecting with each other. So that's, I think, my intention. Is the meaning of bittersweet that however painful death is, there's the sweetness of love and we wouldn't mm. avoid it for anything. Mm. Yeah, I was thinking long and hard for many months about what to call the book and the word just sort of dropped into my head one morning and perhaps that was divinely orchestrated by Ben. It encapsulates, I think, this idea of what was and what is now and that pain will always exist, of course, but there is such sweetness and joy to be found as well in what comes next. And mm. it's this idea that this duality after loss exists, basically, that there is, we have capacity to hold both the bitter and the sweet. I'm very grateful actually for everything that has unfolded since my life is beautiful, perhaps even mm. more so now than it was before, because I have the, the very hard earned uh, insights and perspectives from death now that I didn't before. So it's an acknowledgement of that duality that yeah. both can exist. And that's very touching. And you and I would both hate toxic positivity. You know, what doesn't break you makes you, whatever the dreadful expression is. Mm -hmm. But I, I think what you're saying that you've learned goes so deep, like mm. into every cell of your body of how precious life is, mm. your life, Manu's life, your mum's life, our life. And if we, through the sort of pain of death, fully recognise how short and precious life is, mm. then we live it more fully. Mm, absolutely. And I would have hated anybody to tell me this in the early days. Yes. But actually there are gifts and there are lessons and that is one of them. I feel personally that to not make the most of my life, what is left of it, until I join Ben, which I believe I will, I will see him again one day, it would actually be a disservice to him and what he went through mm. because he so wanted to be here. Mm. I am afforded the gift of life. I get to wake up every morning touch wood so with my health so far <laughs> and let's hope I can do so for another 50 years yes, but, at least mm, but that is such a gift that he isn't afforded so I try to keep that in my mind and of course life gets in the way doesn't it we do sweat the small stuff I touch on this in yeah. the book but I often have you that you wish you didn't mm, but you do mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. But I often have that in the back of my mind. And I just think when you've survived something that at the time you thought was unsurvivable, it has revealed a resilience in me, a robustness in me, I think, that anybody who's gone through hard things also has. And we can draw a lot of strength from that. We Confidence, confidence in your capacity. In yeah. Exactly, to endure whatever life throws at us. And it does mean that the smaller things that perhaps would have really got to me, would have really impacted me before, don't so much anymore. And that's quite freeing. You experience things from a completely different vantage point with that perspective I mentioned. Yeah. Um, that perception gives you the depth of understanding of, A, I can more than survive this, I can actually thrive. Mm. And what really matters is that I'm alive. So if this thing doesn't come off or this person's horrible or whatever goes wrong, it changes your perspective mm. of it. And that enables you to manage it. Mm -hmm. It frees you to manage mm. it and not let it knock you out. Absolutely. I often think, well, has anyone died? Because yes. that really, to me, that really is the worst eventuality. So nothing will ever feel as bad as that. So, so on that really significant point, thank you very much, Lottie, for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. The pleasure is all mine. It's been such an honour to talk to you. I've really enjoyed it. Oh, me too. Hello, Sophie. What a lovely conversation I had with Lottie Bowser. And I think one of the sort of tender and painful aspects of the conversation was being bereaved in a, as a widow so young. Mm. I thought it was... Um... I thought she did such a kind of beautiful job of being able to share living alongside both grieving and loving one man while also falling in love with another. I think we tend to think that if someone's, if a, even if a relationship has ended and not as a result of loss, we think that someone must be over them or that love isn't still a part of their life anymore. But actually it's very possible to lose a partner and love them and love someone else at the same time and socially I think you struggle with that as socially acceptable but also it's it's been a struggle for her too hasn't it she's talked about how it's been really difficult territory as wonderful as it has been to find somebody new I think we put people and emotions in boxes and we give them permission to do this then and not to do it at another time and as human beings, our hearts have an extraordinary capacity to both feel intense pain and have a, a lust, actually, for life and to fall in love with life whilst feeling a lot of pain and loss. And I hope that can become more in the kind of public conscious because we start judging when we don't fully recognise that. And I think for that reason, it's why people can find it so helpful to find a group or a community who have had a similar experience to themselves, because often those kind of nuances or complexities are just immediately understood and the judgment is often much less. And it's not that other people isn't possible for them to understand, but there is an ease in finding those spaces. And I would really recommend anybody to look up groups, whether it's grief or another issue as a way of supporting themselves, because it does have fewer barriers in that way. I agree. I think that's a, a really useful insight, Safe, that if you can find people who've had a similar experience, how, however you find them, you can help understand yourself in understanding others, not feel so alone, That because you can feel so isolated, and like, particularly if you're a young person who's grieving your partner. Um, you can feel like the only person in the world. So I think that's really helpful. Even, you know, Lottie loved dance and yoga. And I think even if you find groups or choirs that are a community of people that you don't have to make a date, 
where you can go and feel that connection in your body of being with other people, that's very protective and helpful when you're grieving. Yes, and that's a slightly different thing, isn't it? It's the power of connection from being in a group, which is less about being understood, but it is about when there's shared movement or shared voice or shared activity, something really happens for our bodies, doesn't it? To bring us back into connection. It's very supportive in that way. The other thing I've been thinking about, not directly related to, related to Lottie, but actually a different conversation I've had this morning, which is about sex and death, eros and thanatos being two sides of the same coin. Mm. And I think in our minds, often we put them onto separate universes. But actually, sex to do with fertility, creating life, death, the end of life, we need to examine both birth and death. But also we recognize that often those two forces are very interconnected and find ways of expressing them. Yes, and it's again a situation of trying to have no judgment for people, isn't it? Because for some people, when they've lost a loved one, they feel very disconnected and shut down and they have no interest in sex or another partner. And then for some people, you know, for example, in Lottie's story, the combination of, of her partner dying while in COVID, she, she describes it as being suff- you know, such a suffocating time that she really had this urge to seek life again, didn't she? And aliveness. Mm. And that was such a natural, Vibrancy. yeah, natural, healthy response to be like, I need to feel alive. I've been in this kind of anticipated coffin space for so long yeah. and deprived of sensation and deprived of people. I mean, that was particularly compounded for people during COVID because of the isolation. And that was isolation from all sorts of sensory pleasure of which sex is just one. Yeah, that's a really good point, Sue. I thought the other thing that was really interesting to hear her express, and I'd be interested if people from the community would say they've had similar experiences, about how she sort of became a different version of herself after Ben died. That in some senses, you know, you talked about it with her in terms of parts, that we can have multiple parts and they all can belong together. And I also thought about it slightly differently of who we are is often a sort of co-created experience. Who we are with one person is something that kind of emerges from what is between us or between us and the people closest to us. And so it's not surprising that being with someone else, something new is created, that the boundaries of the self are not as shit as we often imagine them to be. Actually, who we are is very fluid often to context to person, to time in our life. We can be very different people at different times and very different people with different people. I think that's such a lovely point. That In the I, thou, there's a third aspect, like in a relationship, in a marriage, there's the you, your partner, and the third aspect, which is the relationship and the marriage, mm-hmm. and that you influence and shape each other. And also there are things that you uniquely share with that person, but it could be a sibling, it could be a friend, and that they, in the connection with them, they bring aspects of you. I mean, that's what's so exciting for me about being in relationships is I discover aspects of myself that have lain dormant, that Mm. suddenly come alive by talking to somebody about something that I suddenly realised there's a whole process and river of thought or ideas or emotion that has lain in me until this person said one word and then suddenly it's come alive and that's a wonderful thing. Mm. Makes me think that in a way a relationship is always a creative endeavour. It doesn't mean it's always a happy creative endeavour or a successful and creative endeavour but something is being created while you're in relationship with someone at all times don't we? But I like the idea of being creative in the sense that when we get less rigid about it and we recognise the fluidity, as you talked about, and the flexibility, that also allows for a lot of compassion and forgiveness, that you can allow more kind of fury or disappointment when you know that it comes from a rich emerging source. I think there's this kind of one conversation and done, cut and run attitude sometimes in relationships. 
Mm. But when there's enough trust that it's an ongoing conversation that you can come back and you can look again and you can reconnect, I think that's very empowering, actually, and gives us a sense of agency in this relationship. Reminds me of that Esther Perel thing. She says, if you want something to be different, you need to do something differently. In the sense yes. of in this creative process that is happening between you and me, if we keep putting the same things in the recipe, we'll get the same cake. But if you want a different cake, that it, but it can be a changing story. It can be a changing pattern in which you bring something new in or do something differently, and then you can create possibly something new. I love that. That's such a good idea. Such a good way of seeing it. I had a question for you. Yes. Is it seems that for all the struggle that Lottie experienced, she did have this ability to embrace and choose life again, although it was obviously very clearly a complicated struggle. And I'm wondering if um, losing someone through suicide can make that a harder choice to make or the type of bereavement, the journey of bereavement can make if there's more guilt or sense of responsibility, not that someone is to blame. You talked about turning pain, turning in on yourself and your shitty committee. And often the more painful that is, do you think the harder it is then to kind of allow us to enjoy life again? I don't think there's a hierarchy in grief, but I think there's more or less complexity. Mm. And I think the complexity of suicide, which I talked about with Paul Nobel and with other guests we've had on the podcast, is that you can get completely locked and imprisoned in the death story and the powerlessness that you felt and the blame that you give yourself that is self-accounted for, that locks you in the past. And I think the difference with Lottie and Ben, a, a death that, uh, although it was well out of time and very traumatic and difficult, and they had a lot of struggles, I think there was a capacity to have the important conversations to say goodbye, that she didn't get trapped in the past by it. And I, I want to know what you think, So We each have our own individual responses to difficulty. And I think Lottie ha has innately a life force in her that she goes for life, even when dealing with death. And whether that's something that she's cultivated or something that is genetic and that was modelled by her parents. I, I, I didn't get to the bottom of that with her, but it's definitely on her side when you choose life. Mm. When you fall, let yourself fall in love in life again, even when you face death. Yes. Yes, I, there's context, but there's also the individual, isn't there? And they're both at play in terms of how bereavement unravels and processes for each of us. And that individual is your genetics, your environment, the things that happened to you. Your previous history your of loss. Your attachment history. All of that. I really want to thank Lottie for such a tender and gentle conversation over something that's so difficult. And I really want to thank all you listeners for being so loyal to the podcast and following and listening to us. I would love you to share this episode and other episodes with people that you think it will be of value to. Also sign on to our Substack letter, which is at the bottom of the show notes, and keep in touch with us. So thank you for listening and goodbye. <laughs>